Hey there, folks. My name is Dan Goodman, and I want to welcome you to another rousing edition of our Stormwind Studios succinct held online remote training sessions, or shorts, as we like to call them. This is the 14th short in the Wireless LAN Essentials series of shorts, focusing specifically on Cisco Wireless Radio Frequency, or RF, capabilities. Now, some of these things we've introduced in other shorts. Now is the time where we're going to kind of circle back to them and dive into them a little bit deeper. We'll begin by exploring the RF capabilities of the Cisco equipment at our disposal. And in a related vein, we'll introduce some new things like radio resource management or RRM and the Cisco Clean Air. Do a brief introduction on that as well. Now, when we talk about radio frequency or RF and Cisco access points, it's kind of those things that are universal, but this is how Cisco goes about it. These are some of the bells and whistles that Cisco offers to us. The first one being a product known as Band Select. Now, most of our client devices out there are going to be of at least the 802.11n variety, which technically makes them dual band devices. They can either communicate with the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz equipment. Now, the problem, for lack of a better term, with 2.4 gigahertz is that it tends to be more congested and may have legacy devices that slow down everything for everyone else. You have to think in terms of you're only as fast as your slowest device. And since most devices, most slower devices use 2.4, 5 gigahertz obviously offers a number of advantages. Band Select will direct these clients to the 5 gigahertz band for RF optimization. The 5 gigahertz band has a higher capacity and is also less prone to interference. This also takes the dual band devices that can use 5 gigahertz and makes them use 5 gigahertz, thereby freeing up the 2.4 gigahertz band for those devices that actually need it, need it, if that makes any sense. Now, this is enableable. If to make up a term there, you can enable it is what I'm trying to say. Uh, it is enableable, if you will, globally on a controller or on a wireless LAN by wireless LAN basis. Now, technically, this is a distributed algorithm that runs on the access point. All newer models support it except for those Office Extend access points. Uh, uh, the controller itself is only responsible for the configuration. By default, band select is turned off. Now, the clients themselves will be identified as dual band during their association with the access point. In this case, the access point will only respond on the 5 gigahertz band. It kind of forces them to make that decision if you think about it in that regard. The next feature that we have within the RF realm, if you will, is called Client Link. Now, this specifically focuses on the mixed client wireless networks we tend to encounter. And that basically means we've got a variety of 802.11 standards, a variety of spatial streams, max throughput, bandwidth capabilities, etc., etc. Now, this technology ensures that these clients can be all they can be. Now, from the client to the core network, gives them faster uplinks and the core network down to the client, focusing on the downlink side of things. Client link uses uh, the enhanced features available in the access points chipset signal processing capabilities. This ultimately means that we're not really adding anything new. We're simply just getting the most bang for our buck. Now, for those familiar with the term beam forming, this is essentially Cisco's beam forming. This means that we are enhancing the signal processing means to direct the signal more towards individual clients. Rather than casting a wide net, we're fishing for specific fish, if you think about it in that regard. Unlike traditional beam forming, client link does not rely upon feedback to make the adjustments. Other vendors have a feedback system to make the adjustments. Client link doesn't need that. It's able to do it without it. Now, all current access points support at least client link version 2.0 with the newer models having support for version 3.0. Really, the main differences between the two 
boil down to 802.11 AC support as well as enhancements for newer model laptops. Essentially, the 3.0 version leverages the multiple antennas to focus transmissions even more so than they were already doing in version 2.0. Now the other options that we'll take a look at here will be once again tomato tomato or MIMO or MIMO however you want to pronounce it. Traditional wireless LANs depend upon CISO single input single output or single in single out. Basically a single radio chain is going to be comprised of one transmitter and one receiver. Now the biggest problem with I don't say CISO, I say CISO, or single in, single out, however you want to say it. Uh, the biggest problem that we had there was multipath. Multipath, if you recall from an earlier short, is basically multiple instances of a signal hitting a device at different times. This is kind of like the bosses asking Peter if he got the memo about the new cover sheets for the TPS reports. If you don't get the office space reference, stop what you're doing and go watch it right now. It's, you'll get it as soon as you'll see it. You're like, oh, that's what Mr. Dan was talking about. Uh, the initial response was basically to limit it to two antennas per band. There was one primary antenna and one secondary antenna. If the primary antenna throughput uh, was poor, it would check the secondary antenna. The system would switch to the secondary going forward. This uh, kind of switching back and forth is known as diversity the signal would remain with that other antenna until another problem was encountered. So even though we've always really had multiple antennas, it was very much like a walkie-talkie conversation. Uh, we're only talking on this one, we can't use this one. Oh, there's a problem over here? Well, now we can switch to this one, and now this one isn't doing anything. 802.11n introduced MIMO or MIMO. I'm just going to say MIMO because that's what I always say. And we discussed that in an earlier short. Multiple antennas were now being used in conjunction with each other. So that means we have at least two antennas doing the receiving and at least one antenna doing the transmitting per frequency band. Up to four transmitters and four receivers per band. If you ever wondered why one day we walked in with two antennas and then the next day we walked in with a bunch of antennas, that's essentially what happened. Multipath was actually converted into a strength to basically form a hybrid version of the signal. This uh, phenomenon, for lack of a better term, is known as maximal ratio combining or MRC. Now this was ultimately performed by the receiver. It basically took all of those instances that were hitting it of the signal and producing a much better version of that signal, kind of almost like a ricochet effect. Uh, for those of you guys who have played sports or baseball or anything like that, actually if you bounce the ball one time, it actually picks up a little speed. It's actually a lot faster than trying to throw somebody out on the fly. I miss sports. Anyways, that, that also means that we're able to take a, advantage of transmit beam forming. Now, transmit beam forming is something we've talked about in other shorts, but this was an attempt to ensure the signal was received in phase. By leveraging multiple antennas, the transmissions could be tailored to each client. The clients would submit feedback to the access points to make the necessary adjustments. You know, a little bit more to the left, a little bit more to the right. That's simplifying it, but that's basically what happened. Uh, the problem was the lack of standardized feedback. You have different vendors that use different feedback mechanisms, and it wasn't able to make the adjustments. It sounded good, but it didn't really come to fruition. Eventually, with 802.11ac, that feedback mechanism was standardized so that every device, regardless of vendor, could sprick and see the same linguity, talk the same language. Austin Powers reference. Moving on from there. This eventually led to what's known as explicit transmit beam forming, or TXBF. We also have spatial multiplexing. This leverages both the transmitter and the receiver to increase bandwidth. A str single stream of data is broken down into multiple streams and transmitted from different antennas. This sounds very familiar if you think about it from the Ethernet side of things. When I've got a 10 megabyte file, very rarely if ever does it go out in one big 10 megabyte chunk. It gets broken up and then put back together on the receiving end. 
Same line of thinking here, except we use the term spatial multiplexing. Now, 802.11ac in particular benefited from MU, MIMO, multi-user, multiple in, multiple out. More spatial streams. Each client has a dedicated spatial, uh, spatial stream. No collisions and full duplex possibilities. Before AC, at very best, we were limited to half duplex. Now, the other feature that we have here is channel bonding. When you look at RF radio frequencies on the proper equipment, a frequency has a certain width. This width is going to be 20 megahertz wide on both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz bands. This width essentially creates channels which are sub frequencies. So channel one on the 2.4 gigahertz band essentially ranges from 2.4 to around 2.423 channel 2 is going to range from 2.405 to right around 2.429. Now the channels used to, had, used to have to add a buffer between one access point and another. Every wireless LAN were, at the time was limited to these 20 megahertz wide channels. Basically wasting that extra space within the entire wireless spectrum. With 802.11n, we introduced the idea of channel bonding to aggregate two adjacent channels together. Basically, wider channels, more room for data. 802.11ac enabled various bonding methods. Not only could we bond a channel once, going from 20 megahertz wide to 40 megahertz wide, we can double that again to 80 megahertz wide and even double that again to 160 megahertz wide. The transmitting device would ultimately indicate the channel width it requires prior to transmission. This ensures that it doesn't consume the total space if it actually doesn't need all of that available space. Now, the other thing that we wanted to talk about here within the RF discussion is radio resource management. Whenever we have multiple access points within range of each other, doesn't matter if there's a controller or not, our primary focus is always on maximizing the capabilities of each access point without degrading network performance. You might think the easiest answer to accomplish this goal is to churn up the transmit power level on all access points to the highest possible value. But, and there's a big but, this could cause too much overlap among the coverage cells which degrades performance. Turning up the power level may be an option for the access point, but the client devices typically don't have this capability. And by default, every access point uses the exact same channel at boot, which causes the signal to compete against each other rather than complement each other. Additionally, the only constant is change, and the only thing more constant than constant change are the constant headaches constant change constantly creates pow i can't believe i got that out correctly what happens with all of these channel selections when an access point fails what if our client needs grow and we need more access points fortunately there is a product that is comprised of several proprietary algorithms that constantly look at our network and optimize power levels as well as channel selection to achieve that goal of maximizing the capability of every access point without sacrificing performance. It's called Radio Resource Management or RRM. Now RRM actually consists of a few feature sub algorithms for lack of a better term that have the ability to detect changes over time to make the necessary adjustments. There's RF grouping, dynamic channel assignment, or DCA, transmit power control, or TPC, and coverage hole detection, or CHD. Now, one of the very first things RRM does is form a RF group that consists of its associated access points. This enables the controller to recognize and configure its access points while acknowledging those that it is not responsible for managing. This is very important when we find ourselves in most typical office spaces where we have neighboring access points that belong to those companies 
as well as those scenarios where we may have multiple controllers in our deployment. The access points that form the RF group essentially create a team of access points. This team ensures that they do not endlessly change their RF settings. Basically, they don't want to say, well, I changed my channel. No, you change your channel. Well, I already changed my channel, so you change yours back. It makes sure that everybody is in the exact same page. The way they do this is by relying upon neighbor discovery packets or NDPs to help identify the members of the RF group. The NDPs will also identify the information the controller needs to make the RF adjustments. For example, if a NDP exceeds a particular threshold, the controller will adjust the access point or not adjust the access point. Now, when we have RF groups in a multi-controller deployment, they can actually be leveraged even more to improve RF quality and wireless LAN performance. Now, that topic of discussion kind of goes beyond what we want to cover right now, but it is something that we talk about in the higher tier courses when we have more time to actually see it in action. So the next RRM feature is dynamic channel assignment, and it is one of the more appropriately named Cisco offerings. The adjacent access points using the same channel cause signal contention and or collision. DCA automatically adjusts channel selection based upon load, noise, interference, and signal strength. This essentially puts together the puzzle for us automatically of selecting the channels to get that balance between maximizing the access points without sacrificing network performance. Now, the other feature that we have within the RRM realm is Transmit Power Control, or TPC. This is yet another appropriately named Cisco product. It dynamically controls the transmit power based upon real-time wireless LAN conditions. It comes in two versions. TPC version 1 is also known as Coverage Optimal Mode because it focuses more on coverage while keeping signals in check. TPC version 2 is also known as interference optimal mode, which means it focuses more on interference avoidance, striving to achieve a balance amongst all access point power levels. Now that particular version is more intended for dense voice over wireless deployments, which means more often than not we utilize TPC version 1. The final RRM sub feature, if you will, is coverage hole detection yet another appropriately named offering. This detects coverage holes caused by a down access point. Neighbors will utilize those NDPs to recognize the coverage hole and feed that information back to the controller. Now the information can also be collected from clients who aid in identifying where and when that coverage hole is occurring. The controller will then feed that information to make the necessary adjustments to TPC and or DCA to plug the hole until the access point is fixed. When that access point comes back online, TPC and DCA will be adjusted back to their normal regularly scheduled programming. Now both DCA and TPC will run within a RF group. Keep in mind that CHD technically runs individually on a controller by controller basis. The reason that it runs more individualistic, if you will, is because of the reliance upon client information and access point information. Finally, we have Cisco Clean Air, and this is gonna be more of an introduction more so than anything. So let's kind of focus on the before here for a second. We've mentioned Clean Air as part of our controller and access point shorts. Now we're going to actually talk about it. Clean Air is based upon spectrum analysis and relies upon a, spector, a spectral uh, analysis generation engine or a SAGE. The standard access point chipsets cannot understand non-802.11 signals. These signals are still considered wireless signals, but they are not considered 802.11. Non-802.11 signals are generally labeled as noise because of their negative impact on 802.11 networks. So what does Clean Air do for us? Clean Air provides complete visibility into the wireless spectrum to detect, 
classify, locate, and mitigate various sources of interference. The, that engine, that spectral analysis genera generation engine, SAGE, that's a mouthful, scans the environment once per second. Any normal Wi-Fi signals are passed on directly to the chipset. It basically instantly recognizes and say, I don't have to do anything with this. Anything that cannot be demodulated by the engine is considered noise. Clean Air feeds that wireless spectrum visibility into Cisco Prime infrastructure via a metric known as the Air Quality Index, or AQI. This provides an easily understandable measurement of RF behavior. It'll produce a report on these interfering devices, average impact on a theoretical perfect spectrum. Basically, this is what it should look like in a perfect world. This is what yours looks like. Now this AQI will range from 0%, which means poor, which means we've got a lot of bad stuff there, to 100%, which is perfect, which means we have no negative impact on our signal whatsoever. All right, folks, that's all we had here for this particular short on Wireless LAN Essentials. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you are notified of these shorts shortly after they become available. Take care.